Well, I guess we'll start off with uh, our prayer listings and there's some updates on it. Ma'am. Oh, it doesn't matter. Let's, let's go ahead and list them, and then we'll pray for them. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bob and Brenda Horn, Billy Wall, and who was the third one? Oh, Justin Wynn. Charlotte Kraps got moved to the Slew Nurses Home if you didn't get that. Yeah. Take Betty off. Okay. Cindy Parrish. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Wayne's got a torn meniscus. <laughs> yeah, I think I knew that. I, uh, we just failed to get him on the list. John Lee Griffith. Oh, I bet he is. I'm sure he's entertaining everybody he can get a hold of. And I talked to uh, Ronnie Rustin uh, yesterday, and he said his mom was doing pretty good. She had to have uh, something uh, cut off her nose. So she wasn't going to be very good patient about that. But other than that, she's doing fine. And there's a, a sticky note on this one. Uh, Buck Rogers and pancreatitis. 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 Gene Rogers. Oh, well, they had it listed as Buck. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then they list Sidney Shaw, and he's got the torn meniscus too, Wayne. So y'all must have drank the same water or something. Anybody else? Okay. This coming Wednesday? We're good, good. Hey, hey, come on in. We're going over the prayer list. Look like we need to pray for Al. He's kind of staggering a little bit. It was a long, hard day. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm not out, we can speak louder. All right. Well, they got me hooked up. I can, I can speak loud tonight. Anybody else? I know we got several people traveling to Carol Whitfield and uh, Rod and Charlene. I know they traveling, so we'll yeah, Jeff Kelly, wherever they at. 
I don't know if it's in Arkansas or Oklahoma or the United States. Oh, okay. Well, they just all over the place then. South Dakota. Anybody else? Uh, friend, <clears throat> Hannah Hartman. Yeah, I've heard you mention him before. Mr. Her. Her, I'm, I'm sorry. Patricia. Yeah, oh, yeah. She's on a ventilator, and she's been that way for about 10 days. They're going to take her off by Saturday, and that options are not good if she hasn't responded. Okay. Anybody else? Wayne, do you, do you mind opening some prayer? You need the microphone or you good? Uh, it's one up here. I'll bring it to you. I don't want you jumping these pews or nothing. <laughs> Just sit down when you get through and she'll, she'll get it. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we first of all, we'd like to thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time that we can come together. We can come together and, and be here, Lord, and share. Share in your word and be with Buddy as he brings us a message here tonight. Also, Lord, I'd like to lift up the ones who have been mentioned here tonight, Lord, as well, with their your healing prayers and healing powers. Because I know there's so many, so many in our community, Lord, as well as others. But also we want to thank you for, most of all, for your son that you sent to us and died on that cross for each and every one of us. For this day he gives us, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Psalms? All right. I hadn't forgotten the agenda. Yeah. All right, everybody sing.
Well, uh, Pat did a good job last Wednesday night, and I'll try to follow that up with uh, the night, and then next week we'll get Pastor Jeff back. So, uh, happy days. Uh, anyway. Uh, he is coming back. I, yeah, yeah, unless he's lost somewhere, he's coming back. We'll hold his pay till he gets back or something. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I, yeah, he'll be back. Uh, well, Wayne kind of mentioned this as we started. And, uh, you know, we've been taking that uh, conversational Spanish class on uh, Sunday night. So, uh, hola. Uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, don't no, don't push it. Man, don't push it. Uh, <laughs> hablo poquito español. I speak very little, very little, and then very little is uh, muy poquito, very little Spanish. But I am learning some things. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that's uh, some things we are learning and. Uh, they can teach them to me. They can teach them to anybody. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, things aren't always as they seem. Um, I've been a Baptist all my life, and most of you have too, so I can tell this story. Um, it seemed that there was a, a Baptist guy and a Methodist guy, come on in, Brad, that saw an ad in the paper, and it said, cruise down the river, $99. And that Baptist guy got to thinking about that thing, and he said, you know, that sounds like a deal. So I believe I'm going to take him up on that. So he walks in the outfitter's shop right there on the river, and the guy behind the counter says, uh, can I help you? He said, yeah, I'm here for the $99 river cruise. The guy said, okay, sign your name up. So he signed his name up. The guy comes out from behind the counter with a bat, hits him in the head, knocks him out, drags him through the office, puts a life jacket on him, life jacket on him, puts him on a big wide board, pushes him down the river. So about 10 minutes later, the Methodist guy comes in. He says, uh, can I help you? Yeah, I'm here for the uh, river cruise, $99 river cruise. He said, okay, sign your name up. So he, the Methodist guy sign, goes to sign his name out. Same thing happens. Guy comes out from behind the counter, hits him in the head with a bat, knocks him out. Drags him through the shop, puts a life jacket on him, puts him on a wide board, and pushes him down the river. About 10 minutes down the river, they catch up with each other, and they don't come to. And the Baptist guy looks at the Methodist guy and says, Hey, you think they're going to feed us on this cruise? The Methodist guy says, I don't know. They didn't last year. <laughs> so things aren't always as they seem. <laughs> but uh, anyway, don't tell about the Methodists I told that story. Well, tell it, tell, I don't care, tell them, they don't mind. Um, tonight, I, I, I wanted to share a, a short devotional uh, coming from the book of Judges and uh, just a little bit of background there. Uh, Canaan's been uh, conquered and uh, Israel plunges into about a 35-year uh, pattern uh, of really national uh, down the hill stuff. Uh, it's a deadly pattern that develops, and uh, the people of, of Israel, they fall in sin, and God disciplines them with foreign oppression. And I thought, darn, this could be 2021, in a way, if you think about it. But anyway, that, that happens, and the people cry out in repentance, and God raises up a deliverer, and peace is restored. And this happens over and over again, I think, in the book of Judges, maybe seven times. Uh, and it just repeats itself. But God's always faithful to his people and extends his grace again and again by sending leaders in Judges or Deborah, Samson, and in particular Gideon. And that's who I kind of wanted to focus on, on tonight was Gideon. And it's from uh, Judges chapter 6 and 7. Now, I'm not going to read all that because it's, it's pretty long, so I'm just going to try to hit the highlights, and uh, I, I don't know what it is about old Gideon, but I've always, he's kind of always been one of my favorites in the Old Testament. I don't, I don't know, for just for some reason. I, I, I can't explain it, but anyway, uh, Gideon is, uh, is the youngest son of Joash, and he's from the tribe of Manasseh, and they are not wealthy and really 
probably some of the poorest of their entire tribe. And at this time, they're living in caves and dens and fear of, uh, of, of, of the Mennonite raiders, which today is probably uh, like the area of Jordan or Saudi Arabia. So these Mennonites, they'd come in, and it lasted for seven years, and they'd come in, particularly in the spring, when the barley and the wheat were ready for harvest, and they'd just steal everything. And they'd run off their donkeys and the oxen and the cattle and everything else, and uh, they'd come in on camels. And as a side note, uh, it said that it may have been the first time that warriors attacked on camels and, you know, that was a big deal back then because a camel can travel 100 miles in a day. So, I mean, that, you know, for them to come in on hordes of camels, they said too numerous to count in uh, uh, Judges 6. Uh, that was a big thing. And so, you know, the Israelite people were basically just living in poverty. And, I mean, they were just really down to, you know, down to, to nothing. Uh, and we kind of, Gideon's kind of introduced uh, in chapter 6 in kind of a humorous and almost pathetic kind of way because they find him hiding in a wine press, which uh, the best I could find out could have been a real big hole in a rock or it could have been a pit dug out where they would stomp the grapes and make wine. And so he's hiding in there trying to thresh out a little wheat for him, his family, or whatever and keep the Mennonite raiders from seeing him. And that's where we uh, we're introduced to him. Uh, and he's pretty much lost all confidence in God from his conversation that you can tell. And they've even become uh, hell worshipers. And uh, uh, the angel of the Lord appears to him and calls him mighty warrior. And Gideon says, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Who are you talking to? You calling me a mighty warrior? I'm the youngest man in my family. My family's the poorest in the whole county. And you're talking to me about being a mighty warrior? Uh, so Gideon uh, says, you know, if that's true, I need some signs or something. So he said, let me go prepare you a meal. So what he tells the angel to wait right there. So Gideon runs back and barbecues a goat, uh, cooks him a loaf of bread, makes him some gravy, Brings it back. Angel's still waiting there. He says, pour it on that rock. Put the goat and the bread on that rock and pour the gravy over it. You know, I can identify with that bread. Well, if you've got a plate of gravy and some bread, you, you kind of make a meal. But anyway, the angel of the Lord's not interested in that, so he takes his rod and touches it, and it's consumed by fire. Phew. So he's really, really got Gideon's attention now. And uh, uh, Gideon is... is uh, is paying attention. So uh, the Lord speaks to him and says, look, Gideon, tonight, or I, I, not tonight, but I need you to take down the altar of Baal, which from what I've read was a, a god of uh, fertility, of weather, for seasons, for war, and stuff like that. And I need you to cut down this wooden pole of Asherah, which is a goddess of motherhood, fertility. So, uh, and then take one of your, your dad's oxen and make a sacrifice for it. So Gideon does it, but he does it at night because he's still a little bit unsure about what God wants him to do. So he does it at night. The next day the village wakes up. They go down to Hardy's, get them a cup of coffee, whatever they're doing, and they see that the altar has been torn down. And they see that there's still oxen smoking on the sacrifice. So they're getting investigating a little bit, and they find out that old Gideon did it. So they go to Joash's home, and they call Gideon out. So come on out. We're going to hang you or whatever they're going to do to you. We're going to kill you. And uh, Joash, for his being, still being, a, I guess, a worshiping Baal, does step up for his son and says, look, you know, there's no need killing Gideon. If Baal can't defend himself and take care of himself being a god, said, you know, let, let, let Baal take care of himself. So they agree, and uh, Gideon is, uh, is, is spared. But it changes his name. Uh, they change it to Jerubbabel. 
who in the world named somebody Jerubabel? How'd you like to be named Jerubabel? That thing just tickles me. I don't know, but it means, it means uh, let Baal take care of himself. But uh, that, that's what happens. And at, at this point, the, the Spirit of the Lord comes on Gideon, and he calls out, sends out word for his army to gather. And uh, about 32,000 troops gather for him. And uh, he's, still, he's still at this point uh, needing some evidence from God. And of course, you know the story of the wet and dry fleece. He said, God said, I, I hate to ask you this, but I, I just need another sign. If, if I put this wool fleece on the threshing floor and in the morning it's wet and the ground's dry, then I'm good to go. So sure enough, the next morning the fleece is ringing wet. In fact, they wrung out a whole bowl of water out of it and the ground's dry. And uh, he didn't say, Lord, I, swear, I really have to ask you again, but could, could you do me one more deal? Let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. So God says, all right. So the next morning, same, that happens. And the fleece is dry and the ground is wet. So Gideon's he's ready now. And uh, he takes his, uh, his uh, army to the uh, spring of Harad, and the Mennonites will camp north of them in the Marah Valley. Marah Valley or Marah Valley, how you pronounce that? And uh, so, you know, they're getting pretty close. And God speaks to Gideon again and says, Gideon, you, you got too many men. <laughs> what? You kidding me? I, I, you saying I'm in the Mennonites over there? I got 32,000. Well, you still got too many. So I tell you what. Announce to them that if any of them are scared or nervous or timid about this battle coming up, that they're welcome to go home. So Gideon gets up on a rock or whatever, takes a loudspeaker or microphone, whatever he's got. He says, Men, if any of y'all are a little nervous about this battle, it's no problem if you leave. So 22,000 left. <laughs> left him with 10. So uh, he's going forward again. God stops him again and says, Gideon, you still got too many. Oh, are you kidding me, Lord? That 22,000 just left. What am I going to do? Take them down to the spring, to the creek, and said, I'll divide them into two groups, and I'll show you who, who, to, who to go to battle with. So he, do, he does that, and they go down to the spring or the creek, whatever right, that's right there, and he divides them into two groups. And one group, he tells Gideon, if they reach down in the water and cup their hands with water and bring it to their mouths, he said, that's group one. He said, if they kneel all the way down in the water and drink it with their face down in the water, he said, that's group two. So 300 reached down in the water, cup their hands, and brought the water to their mouth. God said, with them 300, we'll wear out the middle of the night. And, you know, and this is just my opinion on this. I, I, I never have read it. But I got to thinking about that thing. And I think what God was telling us and them is God doesn't need timid warriors, does he? He needs us to be brave today. Uh, just as he told them in, a, in, in Gideon's time. And, you know, uh, it, is a, it is a battle I mean, it is a war. Uh, Bill probably knows, I don't know when we sang the song on with Christian soldiers marching as to war. So, you know, it, it, is, a, it is a war, and God needs, God needs warriors that aren't afraid. And finally, with the 300, and this is, again, my opinion on this. You may have a different one. When a guy reached down in the water with his hand and brought it to his mouth, he kept his eyes open. He was alert. He was looking for the enemy. And you know, we need to be like that, alert, looking for the enemy, not sticking our face down in the creek and not paying attention to what's going on around us. So that's just my opinion on that. But anyway, uh, that, that's who Gideon's left with, 300 elite fighters. And, uh, you know, warfare just takes on a whole different perspective with God. And instead of giving them spears or whatever they, weapons they had, they're given clay jars, torches, 
and trumpet of some kind, horns, trumpets, something. And that's who they can go to battle with. And so Gideon is told, to, is told or decides to divide his forces into three groups of 100 each. And I thought, you know, that didn't work too good for uh, Custer when he divided his forces, but maybe he, didn't ins- and, uh, maybe he didn't consult with the Lord before all that happened. But anyway, he divides his forces into 100, three groups of 100, and they surround the Midian camp at midnight. And Gideon tells, gives them the instructions and says, look, follow my example. Fight for the Lord and for Gideon. So I think it was important that Gideon knew to list the, the Lord first. And so when he does that, they blow the trumpets, they break the jars, the torches flash up, and it just throws the whole Midianite army into confusion. And they go to killing themselves, they turn on each other, they think, Midian, they think uh, Gideon's in on top of them, and they're out. And Gideon runs them, slam out the country, kills two of the generals, and just wows them out, just wows them out. And in kind of closing everything up, uh, there's about four points that I wanted to try to make tonight, and we'll kind of close it up with that. You know, when the angel of God spoke to Gideon and uh, called him a mighty warrior, he described him according to what he would become and not what he was. Because what he was was timid, <laughs> a Baal worshiper, and hiding from the men in the nights, and not sure about anything that God could use him for. But uh, the first point that I want you to try to remember is God always sees the best in us. He saw the best in Gideon. He looked past his faults and his weaknesses, and just like he does us. And he knows that uh, if we trust him, that he'll provide everything we need for the battle, wherever it is, whatever it is. And then the second point that I wanted to call out was, uh, why did Gideon have to tear down the idols? Well, he had to. God told him to. The Lord spoke to him, and he followed the orders to tear them down. You know, and I, I thought, well, do we, do, do we today worship idols? I ain't seen no golden calves in no yard or no Asherah, Asherah poles or nothing like that, but we do have idols, don't we? Whether it be wealth or fame or fortune or time or things or whatever. Anything that takes the place of God, in effect, is an idol. So uh, all of us are, need to be, including myself, need to be aware of that. And the third point I wanted to make is, is we're all unfinished products. You know, Gideon was young. He was scared. He was hiding. And not once but three times he asked for requests for God to give him signs the fleece, the meal. And he wanted to be sure that he was getting his instructions correctly. He was growing in his faith, and it would need to be tested, you know, when this, when this battle came up. So, you know, what we can take from that is like Gideon, we're unfinished products. Uh, God's still working on me. <laughs> Isn't that a song, Bill? Uh, making me what he wants to be. I don't remember the rest of it. But he's still working on us. We are unfinished products as we continue to grow. Um, only with his guidance can we do that and strengthen it. And the fourth, and I guess the, probably the most important thing that I, I wanted to mention was uh, in Gideon's case, victory itself wasn't the goal. God's victory was. That's why he got it down to 300 men. Because you can't explain that kind of victory 300 defeating 135,000. If I did my math right, Miss Helen ain't here, so I, maybe I did it right. She might be listening now. Uh, that's 450 to 1. That's a heck of some odds. So it was no doubt that the victory that Gideon was able to work the win was through, the God's, was through God's power. And he was, God, Gideon was really only doing what God called him to do, leading the revolts against these oppressive uh, Midianites. You know, we can, have, uh, we can have pure motives, we can have faith, and we can have God's agenda, and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, the problem 
is when human wisdom wants to enter into that and it trips us up. And, you know, God wants us to be used for his purposes and uh, his means are a lot different than sometimes ours means. And I, I, I did write this down and underline it, so I want to repeat this. For his glory to be demonstrated, human glory has to be minimized. If I was teaching and I repeated something, it'd be on the test. Okay? So I'm going to repeat this, but no test. For his glory to be demonstrated, human glory has got to be minimized. That's why Gideon was able to defeat 135,000 armed Midianites with 300. We can't earn the honor and then go back and give it to God. It's got to be given to him first. And that's what Gideon learned. And Paul reminds us about that centuries after Gideon when he says in Ephesians uh, 6.10 to be strong in his mighty power. And that, that's, that's, you know, nobody likes to admit that they got weaknesses, uh, but we do. But what God wants us to do is let those weaknesses be the occasion for his power to enter in. Just like Gideon was a good example of. You know, poorest in his family, youngest in his family, no training of any kind, but yet God saw in him something that he could use, and he was able to do that. Um, I don't know where I got this from, but uh, I've always kept it. And it goes like this. I'm a nobody telling everybody about somebody that can save anybody. And you know... <laughs> None of us like to admit our weaknesses, but we have to be willing to allow God to work through us, through those weaknesses, to claim the victory. And that's what I had tonight. Is there any comments, questions, or whatever? Neil, Neil had questions last week. He's not here, so maybe I won't have to be put on the spot. Anything. What I'd like to remind folks we got assembly Sunday school Sunday morning, nine thirty. In the fellowship hall. Right. Right. With donuts. With donuts. Feed them Baptists, they'll show up. Anything else? Wayne, well, hope you heal up good. Brad, you don't close us in prayer. We didn't mention Brad. I hope he doesn't mind, but he's having some problems too, right? Yeah. 